If you're over 40 and from Wichita Falls, you can probably remember cruising Kemp long after businesses closed down on a Friday and Saturday night, parking in their empty parking lots and just hanging out with your friends. If you're a tad older, you can remember nightclubs like Little Brothers and the Stardust. For one mom, she will never forget her experience with the Stardust. It is forever seared into her memory. The story, for as long as it's been told, has been one of those bullshitting style stories. You know, the ones you tell when there's a bunch of you sitting around and someone pipes up and says, Oh, hey, tell them about that one time. And until she put pen to paper, that's all this story was. In 1986, there was a brief time that you were legal to drink at 19. But all of that was going to change come September 1st when the law would change that number to 21. February of 1986, I turned 19 and I was hell bent on living it up until that September 1st deadline. Back then, Wichita Falls had a nightclub called the Stardust located in Parker Square, a shopping plaza still a part of the face of Wichita Falls today. It was a place to go to dance, drink, meet new people, and to hook up. The Stardust was open six nights a week, and I was there for five of them with my best friend, Ruth. We were there from the time our jobs were over to the time the club closed down. Of course, the guys that checked IDs at the door got to know us by name. One of the guys working the front door was Barry and Wardrop, and he chatted me and Ruth up whenever he was working. He was always friendly and smiling, we had no idea what his name was or that we were actually talking to a monster. Outwardly, he was a likable guy and not bad looking. One night, it was getting close to last call and I was talking to Farian while he was working. One thing led to another and I ended up inviting him to my apartment after the club closed. He followed me over to my place after I picked up my seven month old daughter from the babysitter. Ruth was my roommate, but she wasn't planning on coming home that night, and even though my house was the place to hang out after the clubs closed, no one had mentioned or planned on being there this particular night. We hadn't been at my place for very long before there was a knock on the door. I opened it, and there stood a couple people I knew from the club. Come on in, I said. Then a few more people showed up and I could see Farian getting more and more irritated with each body that came through my front door. I thought it was because he thought we were going to be alone, but back then I was more social than I am now, and I was just thinking he needed to go along and we could be alone some other time. After about a half a dozen people were in my apartment, Farian got up and said, I'll catch you later, and left, visibly upset. I was having fun, and to me, it was his loss. A couple weeks went by when one morning the local news was talking about a man named Ferry and Wardrop from Wichita Falls. He had been arrested on a beach in Galveston, Texas after confessing to committing murder. Well, I started paying closer attention and sure enough, it was the very same Ferry and Wardrop that had just been in my apartment not very long ago. They said that he had killed a woman named Tina Kimbrew and she had been found strangled to death in her apartment. Needless to say, I was freaking out just a little, thinking how lucky I was that my daughter and I were still alive, and it would be years before I would know just how lucky and close I had become to being one of the five women, essentially a sixth, that he had murdered. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we're going to Wichita Falls, Texas, a small metropolis northwest of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Wichita Falls isn't filled with glitz and glamour like its neighboring megacity. Most say there isn't much to do around there, but it offers a top-rated university and one of Texas's technical training Air Force bases and home to the rock group Bowling for Soup. Those who are from the area do not see what the outsiders see. This is a place to raise a family in. Generations have come and gone in this town, and to them, Wichita Falls isn't a lump of coal, but a diamond in the rough with a few flaws. Ferry and Edward Wardrop, a serial killer who sets on death row from the panic he brought down on the community in 1984 until 1986 when he could no longer live with the path of destruction that he had created, 
is one of those flaws. And tonight, we are going to dig into his past. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of murder, rape, and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. If you feel any of this may be too much for you, please skip this podcast or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, all of my true crime nerds, and welcome back. If you haven't listened to the latest series, 30 Years of Terror, the the story of BTK, all five episodes are up. So go check them out after you listen to this episode and tell me what you think. If you're on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, make sure you are following me so that you never miss a case or an update from the librarian. If you're tuning in on my YouTube channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring that notification bell so that you never miss an upload. Last. Don't forget to go check out the discussion page on my YouTube channel for those of you who do not do social media, and there I will be posting updates as needed. Let's show a little love to some of my true crime nerds. Welcome the newest nerds, Rihanna and Mel. Shout out to Jesus Martinez, Karina Goodnight, and last but certainly not least, Leah Abramson. These nerds have taken a moment to leave a word, review, recommendation for the show, and I could not be more grateful. Podcasts live and die by the word of mouth, and for me, we need as many words out there as we can get. If you'd like to make it onto the list for love for the true crime nerds, I simply ask that you leave a review or recommendation, and don't forget to use the hashtag the true crime librarian on social media so that I can see your reviews and recommendations. Finally, go check out the website at thetruecrimelibrarian.com. It's new. It needs work. We're we're working toward it. It has potential, but it gives you an opportunity to click on that donate button and support the show. If you would like to get something in return, you can always head over to the merchandise store and pick yourself up a shirt, sticker, or mug. And keep a lookout. This month, we have something up our sleeves, and you will only get 30 short days to get it. Enough of all of this. Let's get to why you all came here tonight. The true crime. Let me introduce you to Fairy and Edward Wardrop. He was born in Salem, Indiana to George and Diana Wardrop. He was the oldest of two boys. He has a younger brother named Bryce. And Fairy had grown up with a seemingly normal childhood. Although in jail and to anybody who would listen to him in his early years in life, He says that he was abused and assaulted. Bryce has stood up for his parents saying, you know, my father could be strict, but George never beat or abused Farian or me. Didn't matter. Farian was still walking around town acting like poor pitiful me. Farian's senior year in high school, he decided he didn't want to stick it out for graduation and he ended up dropping out. At the young age of 19, he decided to join the U.S. National Guard. In March of 1983, Farian married his first wife, Joanna D. Jackson. And at this point, Farian was starting to struggle with his drug addiction and an alcohol addiction and was really not doing very well as a husband. In 1984, he was discharged from the National Guard for less than honorable circumstances. He had been in trouble for several times for smoking pot, disorderly conduct, and a several counts of being AWOL. It wasn't good. It seems like he had this, this pattern of self-destruction beginning. The same year he was discharged, he began a new job at Wichita General Hospital as a janitor, which means he was cleaning up after people, something he really didn't want to do, but He had a wife at home and she was pregnant with his kids, you know, so he had to, but he didn't want to. This was not the life he had chose for himself. Joanna's parents had to step in and pay bills for the couple. And this was almost, this was just not something Farian was comfortable with. It felt like he was underneath their thumb and had to do what they said because they paid his bills. But in retrospect, he wasn't doing anything to to better the situation. He didn't try to find a better job, a better paying job. 
He was spending his money on drugs and alcohol in order to erase the fact that he was not being responsible. It just, it was a vicious cycle. But in the end, Farian hated that he felt like he was under somebody else's control. So it fueled him to do more drugs and drink more alcohol. It just was not a good time for him. And he, it's almost as if he was starting to develop a different personality. And he was so angry at so many people and life was being unfair and he couldn't, he couldn't take it. Varian would later say that he, at, at points he would get off from the hospital, wander the streets of Wichita Falls, looking for drugs, alcohol, partying with whoever he could get, you know, to let him come and get high with, never once darkening the door of his house, only to return to the hospital for his next shift. Never going home, never showering, possibly never sleeping, depending on what drugs he was using. So it just, it made the whole thing a little off. Farian did work hard at the janitor's position, and within a short time after starting, he, he was promoted to an orderly. And orderlies at that time, instead of cleaning up after others, he was simply helping the nursing staff with patient care. On December 21st of 1984, Terry Lee Sims, she was a young EKG tech who was working at Bethania Regional Healthcare Center. Here's the thing with the two hospitals. Bethania Regional Healthcare Center sat about three blocks away from Wichita General Hospital. It was what was known as their medical district down there because doctor's offices were starting to pop up around the hospitals, allowing the doctors to get to either hospital within a short amount of time if need be. Now, the two have merged into one hospital known as United Regional Healthcare Center. But in the 1980s, Wichita Falls had two hospitals within about four blocks of each other. And Terry worked at the other, just blocks away from Wichita General where Farian was working. And it, you could say he probably seen her before this night, who knows, because his drug-induced alcohol binge mind couldn't remember for sure. But on the, on the night of December 21st, he was standing on Bell Street when Terry Sims and her friend Lisa Boone pulled into Lisa's driveway of a little two-bedroom, one-bath house at 1509 Bell Street. Lisa and Terry were just coming home from a night of Christmas fun with their friends. They did a party and exchanged gifts and things like that. And, and it was raining, and Lisa had been called back to do another shift. She was going to work a double. and. In what was planned for the evening after the party that Terry and Lisa were going to study, Terry lived on the other side of town, and most times it was just easier to go home and stay with Lisa because she could, it was very quick. Lisa lived very close to the hospital. So Terry decided she was just going to go in and sleep at her house, so Terry took Lisa's keys so she could get into the house. And Lisa took Terry's keys so she could use her car because she, you know, Terry needed in the house for one and for two, Lisa had no gas. So Farian's standing out in the rain and he watches the young five foot one, 94 pound Terry Sims climb the stairs, open the front door and let herself into the home. Then he watched Lisa Boone back from the driveway and take off towards Bethany Regional Hospital. And for whatever reason at this point, Farian had this desire to talk to Terry. He needed to tell her. He needed to explain himself. Now it's notable to say he was high. Now what he was high on, God only knows. At the time, in the 1980s, cocaine had become this amazing, most perfect drug. It was exploding into the club scenes and the kids were using it. It was just... It was an easy way to get high and not get angry and everything felt good. And they, it was just, for them, it was like sugar. And if you've ever seen cocaine, it looks like sugar. But at the same time, methamphetamine was still on the market or is on the market, but it was nowhere near what it is today. Manufacturing methamphetamines in the 1980s did not happen like we see, thanks to Breaking Bad, in that manner. 
So could you say that Farian was high on methamphetamines? Probably. And once I go over this crime scene, you're going to understand why I think he was high on meth. He walks up to the door and he knocks on the door that Terry had just gone in. Terry reluctantly opens the door and immediately Farian pushes his way into the small home, closing the door behind him and locking it. And once he's inside, he gets his hands on Terry within a short time. And this poor girl is frightened, unaware of what's going on, doesn't know why this man is in the home or why he's so angry. And as he slings her around, he's saying to her, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. I need to tell you why. And he's just, he starts, he begins punching her, splitting open the skin across her cheeks and eyes and she, she, her glasses are broken, knocked off her face. She's crying. She's trying to defend herself, but Therian stands six foot six and weighs 220 pounds. Now we hear 220 pounds. We're kind of thinking he's a hefty guy, right? No, think his frame is six foot six. 220 pounds is nothing. There's no meat on this kid, right? But he does outweigh Terry Sims by about 130 pounds. So, He's slinging her around like a rag doll. She's trying to defend herself. She's had a couple courses in self-defense classes. So she kind of had an idea of how to. But Farian's rage was so chaotic and it was so unwarranted that she wasn't really sure how to defend this. And as Farian starts to beat her, he decides he's going to take her to the bedroom. And he pulls out a hunting knife, grabs the back of her shirt, and drags Terry to the bedroom. As he's doing so, though, he's taking the tip of that hunting knife and poking her in the chest. And these are what l we'll later learn are called tease wounds. And he's just trying to s keep her frightened, keep her scared. Because as long as she's frightened and scared and she can't think clearly, he has control of the situation. So he gets Terry into the bedroom and she begins fighting back and at some point she grabs on to the blade of this hunting knife. Now it's about an inch wide and four and a half inches long. It's a pretty good sized knife. And when she grips onto that blade, she grips with everything that she has and ends up severing her pinky finger. And then there are deep, disgusting gashes on her third, second, and first finger. This does not stop her. She doesn't recoil that she doesn't try to protect the damage to her hand she's still trying to hit at him and punch him and get him off Farian finally finds what's a yellow extension cord that was plugged into the waterbed heater that the two were struggling on and he cuts away a section of it and he binds Terry's hands behind her back he cuts away her clothing and decides she's going to she's going to take care of him. And so he forces Terry to get down on her knees and perform oral sex on him. And he is shoving her face hard into his groin until he climaxes. I cannot say what she felt like. I I imagine her shuddering and crying and not really understanding the situation. But for Farian, the idea that he had that much control over the situation only kept him excited. Therefore, he ends up throwing Terry down on the ground and violently raping her um, before he climaxes for a second time. It's that control, that feeling that he doesn't have to answer to anyone that really, really sets him off. Once he's done taking advantage of Terry in her naked body, he picks her up and he drags her into the small bathroom of the home. He lays her over the edge of the tub and he sinks the hunting knife into her back three times before she rolls to her front offering her chest, which he then stabs an additional seven times. These 10 stab wounds do not include the tease wounds that are on her body already. Medical examiners did confirm that her left pulmonary artery was punctured from one of the wounds and that the young woman died within minutes of this injury. So there's hope that there was very little suffering after that, but there's no guarantee. 
The entire scene is a complete overkill. It's chaotic. It's mimicking the mind of him as it's high. And he had this abnormal strength about him. It, I mean, even if he was completely sober during the attack, he would still be able to overpower Terry because he did outweigh her and he was, he had a longer reach, he had a longer stride. It was just physics, right? But this is why I say he possibly was high on methamphetamines. And that's because if he was on methamphetamines, it would account for the amount of rage that he had. It would account for the fact that he was able to hallucinate that he was not talking to Terry, but to his wife. And Varian will later come back and say that the women that he killed, nine times out of ten, he saw his wife in them, sometimes his mother. But I'm going to let you know, by the time we get to, en to the end of the story next week, where you're going to be in the same boat as me and you're not going to know whether it's up or down because he lies just because he can open his mouth and say something. That's who he is as a person. So whether or not he truly saw his wife or his mother in these, these women's face, that's a different story. However, they did all closely resemble his very first wife. So high on meth, uh, hallucinating the, this overkill, this chaos, this um, abnormal amount of strength, um, it, it explains the entire scene because when one walks in, it looks like a tornado blew through that house. And really all it was was a, a, you know, a high man who decided to take advantage of the fact that this woman was home alone. At 7 a.m., Lisa Boom pulls into her driveway and she walks up to the door. And because she gave Terry her keys the night before so she could get into the home, she needed to knock. She knocked a few times hoping to wake up her friend, but Terry never answered the door. Luckily, Lisa's landlord just lived right around the corner. So she walked around the corner to the landlord's home, borrowed their key, went back to her house and unlocked the door. When she stepped into the living room, she stopped and immediately recognized that this was not the scene she needed to be alone in. It was chaotic. Everything was out of place. Things were on the floor. Couch cushions were messed up. Terry's glasses, Terry's shoes. It, it sent off alarm bells in Lisa's mind, okay? And she knew, I, I don't need to be here. I need to go. So she leaves the house, goes back to the landlord, and when she had gone to borrow the key, she had spoke to the wife of her landlord. This time, she needed her landlord himself to go and check the home because something's not right, something's wrong, and she's afraid that Terry's hurt. So the landlord goes back to the home on 1509 Bell Street with Lisa, and he enters the home. And he sees the exact chaotic scene that Lisa saw when she opened the front door. But where she stopped, hesitated, turned around, and left, he kept going. With each step, you could see the chaos and, and imagine what had gone on in the scene of this home until he got to the bathroom door. And there was Terry laying on the floor in a pool of her own blood. Wichita Falls Police Department was called, and it wasn't long before... Law enforcement littered the entire home and neighbors lined the streets trying to figure out what had happened. The medical examiner did noted all of the injuries to Terry's body. He swabbed Terry's mouth, vagina, and anus. Her mouth and vagina came back positive for male sperm, therefore confirming what investigators had suspected that she had been raped. There was no alcohol or drugs found in her system and the, it ruled out something else for investigators because immediately once they walked into this scene, they went to the same place. They were like, this, this is chaos. This isn't organized. This could possibly be like a, a, a disagreement between a druggie and a dealer. Maybe she Maybe she was a drug user and maybe she owed her dealer some money and he found her and this is the result. So they start looking into the avenue that Terry Sims is a drug addict. However, they are right in the fact that there was a drug addict in that home. 
They're just wrong with the person who was the drug addict. Terry wasn't. Terry, you know, was abandoned by her mother. She helped raise her siblings with her great grandmother. Terry was very career and successfully driven. There was no time for her to to experience the highs of illicit drugs. But Fairy and Wardrop, who by chance saw Terry and took advantage of the situation, he was high. He was a drug addict. He was an alcoholic. What happened and how he felt after this murder will forever be speculated. He can tell you, and we can talk about this next week when we talk about the trial, but I don't believe for one minute that he walked away from that house that night and had remorse for what had just happened. Not nowhere. We'll see what he has to say next week, but he was high. He wasn't seeing Terry Sims. He was seeing his wife, according to him. He didn't walk away from that scene remorseful. I think he walked away shocked that he was capable of doing something so violent. With investigators not really having a place to go other than an ex-boyfriend of both Lisa's and Terry's who turned out to be with an alibi the night of the murder, they were standing at the brink of their first cold case in this series of crimes. Had Farian had remorse, had he felt like he did something he could never come back from, Had there been any inkling to change who he was, this next incident would have never happened. But in less than 30 days, he was back at it with a new victim. On January 19th of 1985, Tony Jean Gibbs, a 23-year-old nurse at Wichita General Hospital, the very same hospital that Farian works at, had just came off of her eight-hour overnight shift. And she was leaving to go home, go to bed, and get ready for the next shift that night. She was driving down the road. She saw Farian walking down the street and she decided to offer him a ride. Farian and Tony had had an encounter prior to her offering him a ride. Farian had saw the very young nurse, thought she was pretty. He wanted to get to know her better. But at the time, Tony brushed him off. But I don't think it's because she felt like he wasn't worthy of her or that she was better than him or whatever. That's not who people describe Tony Gibbs as. She's very nice, very likable. She was willing to get to know you before she called any kind of judgment. So the day that he decided he was going to approach her, could she have had something else on her mind? Quite possibly. I mean, she was a nurse. There's no telling what her cram pack schedule had been. But he didn't see it as she was busy and he just had bad timing. She saw it as she blew me off. So when Tony pulled up to offer him a ride, he was a little bewildered. He didn't understand. Why is she now being nice to me? But it didn't matter because Farian was quick to accept her offer as he had no way of getting home other than walking. He gets into the car and the, the switch changes. He's not the same person who just stood at the driver's side window agreeing to a ride. He was a new person and he instructed her, you're going to drive out to US 281 and you're going to go now. Now to anybody from within 50 miles of Wichita Falls knows that US 281 lies just outside of the Wichita Falls city limits into what is known as Archer County, which means Wichita PD, Wichita County, police department none of them had that jurisdiction once these two crossed that county line it was going to be it was going to prove difficult to to be able to link these two cases together because you have one agency working on one and one agency working on another we have a couple more speed bumps in the road with when it comes to tony's case but it makes it hard to tie ferry into both of these cases leaving him out of the realm of possibility. As the two drove out to US 281, Farian begins to become irate. He gets angry. He's telling Tony he hates her. He just wants to talk to her, but he hates her. She's scared. She's He's being unpredictable. She's not really sure what is going to happen once they get out to 281, but she's scared to not drive out there and find out what would happen if she didn't listen. 
he begins to he grabs a hold of her jacket and he begins to push and pull her in the car just pinging her around like a pinball in a pinball machine and it's easy he's you know he has this tall frame he has a little bit of weight to him tony gibbs is exactly the same height and weight as terry sims five foot one 94 pounds so he is able to manipulate her body any way he wants to she's crying he's screaming he hates her she wants to know what she's done for him to hate her but Farian claims that it wasn't Tony he was looking at. It was his wife. As they get out to this desolate road, he pulls her one time too many and she runs off the road into a ditch, almost causing them to crash. But she's able to get back up on the road, get the car stopped, and she jumps from the car and she takes off. She has nowhere to run to. There's nothing out there. In Texas, we only have dead grass and mesquite bushes in northern Texas. So there's nothing there. There's no businesses by. The city has not expanded out that way. There's nothing there. But she is not going to lay down and die. She's going to try and save herself. Unfortunately, with Farian being six foot six, he had a longer stride. And it took no time for him to catch up to her and throw her to the ground. Farian hits her a few times before he decides to drag her over to this abandoned bus that had once caught fire, or it was an abandoned trolley that had caught fire. There's conflicting of what it is. It looks like a trolley, so we're going to go with it. As he's dragging her across this field, it's cold, the grass is dead, he's got a hold of her jacket, and he's got this hunting knife, this new... Whether the same knife or not is used, it is never clarified in anything that's been released to the public. But he has a knife, and he is causing the exact same tease wounds to her body that he did to Terry Sims. Once he gets her over to the trolley, he throws her in and onto the floorboards, and he cuts away her nursing uniform. Now, thanks to him giving her some tease wounds, she has blood all over her uniform. Farian cuts it away, stuffs it under the floorboards of the trolley, thinking nobody will ever see it down there. And he climbs on top of the very small petite Tony, and he begins to violently rape her. Once he climaxes, he's still not satisfied. The screams of Tony have only fueled his fire and possibly whatever drug he is high on. And he flips her over and he sodomizes her with the same amount of force that he had just raped her with. Until he's satisfied there. till he climaxes. Once the assault is over, Tony lays down on her belly on the floor. She's laying flat and she's crying. She's trembling and Farian's waiting to catch his breath. He's not done with her. Although Tony is laying next to him praying that he will get up and leave and everything will be okay. Farian gets up climbs over Tony, and sinks his hunting knife into her back three times. Once she rolls over to try and defend herself, he sinks the knife three more times into her chest, and she also suffers from some defense wounds on her left hand. Once very satisfied that even though she's not dead yet, she is going to die, he, he leaves the trolley, climbs into her Camaro, pushes the seat completely back, and he takes off back to Wichita Falls, leaving her there in that desolate area to do nothing but die. But Tony, she's a fighter, and she crawled from the trolley car for about 100 yards until she succumbed to her injuries and passed away. That evening, when Tony was due to come in to Wichita General for her shift, and she never showed and she did not call in her supervisor immediately knew something's not right here this is not like tony and she decides to give jeff gibbs tony's brother who also lives in wichita falls a phone call and let him know tony didn't come to work she's missing nobody can get a hold of her she's not at home we have no idea where she's at Jeff, a little worried, he calls his older brother, Walden, who lives in New Mexico, and he tells him, you know, Tony didn't go to work and we can't, we can't get a hold of her. It doesn't take long for Walden to get in the car and drive like a bat out of hell to Texas, and he's here within a few hours, and the two brothers go to Tony's apartment at the Rain Tree Apartments and enter to see what, if anything, could lead them to where their sister's at. 
As soon as they walk into the apartment, they notice that nothing's out of place. Nothing happened here. There was no break-in. There was no kidnapping. Where the hell is their sister? So Jeff is standing there as the two are trying to contemplate what would Tony have done when he remembers Tony had just called him not too long ago to talk about receiving some weird and scary phone calls. Sometimes the person calling would be threatening and terrifying in his words. Other times it was simply heavy breathing on the line. This freaked Tony out to the point that she went to Jeff and she asked him, you know, I'm scared about my safety. What kind of firearm would be best for me to carry to protect myself? And Jeff decides, let's start you with a can of mace first instead of a firearm. So he buys his sister a can of mace, shows her how to use it and sends her on her way. Now that he is recalling this conversation, he's worried. He picks up the phone, calls Wichita Falls PD, and he reports a missing person, his sister, Tony Jean Gibbs. After the phone call to the PD is made, he is now in charge of making the very difficult phone call and calling their parents, W.L. and Donnie Gibbs. As soon as Jeff tells his parents what is going on with Tony, they offer up a $1,000 reward to any information to lead to her whereabouts. They get into their car and they come to North Texas as well. Now, once the news breaks of Tony Gibbs missing, and the reward of $1,000, a local radio station KLUR disc jockey, Johnny Tidwell, goes on the air encouraging his community of Wichita Falls and the surrounding areas to keep their eye out and help find Tony Gibbs. He even eventually set up an account to raise even more money for the reward, and I want to say it got into the neighborhood of about $12,000. Initially, he wanted ten. dollars but it exceeded what he, you know, anticipated. As the community was out looking for Tony, Farian saw the news of her missing. But in his mind, because there wasn't a body found, because nobody actually knew what happened to Tony, then what he remembers happening in that field on 281, it didn't really happen. It was a hallucination due to a drug high, due to some bad drugs. He didn't really kill that girl. What he's remembering is fictional right? That's, that's got to be it. I didn't really do that. I couldn't do that again. I mean, I killed that other girl, but they don't have a body, so I didn't kill this one, right? On February 15th of 1985, a utility worker was heading out to the desolate field on US-281 as there was a transformer there that had been acting up and needed replacement. But due to some freezing temperatures, the replacement had been put off. As he's walking in the field, he saw what he thought initially was a mannequin. When he steps a little bit closer, he realizes it's a woman. She's completely nude and she's dead. He leaves the field, gets back into his utility vehicle, and he, he calls law enforcement. And it isn't long before there's multiple agencies out there working this crime scene in 27 days from the day that she was reported missing and one day following what would have been her 24th birthday, Tony Jean Gibbs is found. The medical examiner in Dallas noted that there was damage done to her body by animals on her arm and calf and there was damage due to an insect infestation. Due to frigid temperatures, there was not evidence of lividity, which is that bluish purplish color that bodies tend to turn after death. There also wasn't any evidence of rigidity. There was, she wasn't stiff. She, she was still bendable. There was a deep penetrating wound to her upper left chest that had punctured the lung below, collapsing it and allowing for a great amount of internal bleeding. She had stab wounds to her diaphragm, spleen, kidney, stomach, and lumbar spine, not including any of the tease wounds that was covering her body as well. Gashes to her left palm and thumb indicated she tried very hard to defend herself against the, her attacker. Vaginal swabs and anal swabs were done, confirming the presence of male sperm and confirming the, the speculation that she had been raped. On February 19, 1985, Farian Wardrop quit his job at Wichita General Hospital and left town. Why? Why? 
that is actions of a guilty person, right? I mean, that's what we're seeing. Of course, we're seeing this whole thing hindsight. There's nothing there to link him to Tony Gibbs. He tried talking to her one time at work while they were both on shift, and she said nothing to him. After that, nobody saw the two having conversations. They didn't go out together. It wasn't routine for Tony to take him home. It was an, a coincidence of the stars aligning in just the right spot for Farian to cross paths with her and then to ultimately kill her viciously. His name doesn't come up in the investigation, okay? His name didn't come up in the investigation of Terry Sims because, again, there was no connection there other than they had all worked within the hospital district. That's your connection. Well, now you've got two dead hospital staff members, a nurse and an EKG tech. The entire nursing staff is, is terrified to leave their shift at night and go to their car. I mean, somebody out there is picking them off one by one. Security is vamped up at both hospitals and any nurse leaving past dusk is escorted to their vehicle. They have to go ahead and make arrangements with security that so that, you know, everybody has an opportunity. But it doesn't matter because the person that they are most scared of skipped town four days after the second body was found. He, he left his wife, he left his children, he left everything he knew in Wichita Falls and, and was gone, disappeared. When Tony Gibbs' body was found in Archer County, and not Wichita County, the investigators in, in Archer held jurisdiction. And there was, the two DAs worked together well in Tony's case. However, because Mocker was voted in that election year that Terry Sims was killed, he was not able to go into that crime scene and walk it firsthand. That's something he liked to do, gave him, you know, gave him an advantage. With her case, he had to hear about it. And that only leads to misinformation, mis misremembering, mis evidence, whatever. And that's the thing. Even with true crime podcasts, it's kind of like playing the telephone game that you used to play when you were a kid, where you would whisper something into somebody's ear. And by the time you got to the end of the line, it was, the, you know, totally different than what you said. That's how it can be played in the world of true crime and, and documentaries and podcasts. If you are not researching relevant places, you're not going to get the appropriate amount of information. And if you don't relay it as though you see it or it's relayed to you, you are just fur furthering the muddying of the story, right? Well, from Maka, that's why he wanted to be on these crime scenes when they came in. With Tony's crime scene, he didn't get to go to it because he was not the Archer's district attorney. He was Wichita County's. So, not his jurisdiction. To connect these two cases with a person that just by coincidence crossed paths with both women was already difficult. Now to have two different investigating agencies looking into both of these crimes separately, there's your second hurdle. This is only spelling out cold case for both of them, right? I mean, in theory, that's what we're seeing. Well, that is until Archer County gets wind of a young man that was going around town telling people about the time he had sat down and talked with Tony Gibbs at the Stardust Club, and it was becoming concerning because he was increasingly becoming as obsessed with the case. And this young man's name was Danny Laughlin. In the weeks that Tony Gibbs was missing, he spoke of their brief moment together at the Stardust, and he says he spoke to her because she was beautiful and she was likable. And it was brief. It, it you know, he can't even recall the the dialogue of the conversation. That's how brief it is. But the more he speaks about talking to this young woman and the fact that she is missing, the less that any of his co-workers remember of him seeing Tony the night he says he talked to her. Somewhere along the way of this talk and 
and and how he was connected to Tony and the two were going to go out at some point and then you know she went she went and disappeared he began to be talk darker about Tony remarks like they'll never find her she's dead and cut into pieces they probably have scattered her all over the place one who is talking about the fact that he was supposed to go on a date with this woman before she went missing and now she's missing and now he's saying she's cut up into chop suey. It's very questionable. How do you know her again? What, what did you say that y'all talked about? You know, questions are starting to be raised by those closest to Danny. Once the news that Tony's body was found came out, it seemed like Danny began to talk even more about her and her case. And this was cause of concern. Danny Laughlin had now saying that this was cause of concern. His friends, his family were, were now wondering, had Danny been the one to take her out to that deserted field and brutally kill her? Is he capable? Is this who he is as a person? Do we not really know who it is? Well, in hindsight, when we look at serial killers, most people are are shocked that that this person was capable of committing something so cruel and, and brutal, right? Okay, now they're looking at Danny Laughlin in this way. And then he does something even stupider, okay? Danny, he claims to have been in the very field that the murder occurred in just days before the body was found to let his exotic wolf and lion cub roam and get some exercise. He says he even climbed to the top of that abandoned trolley so he could keep an eye out as, on his animals as they ran free. Now remember this. Had he been in that field, she was only 100 yards away from this trolley, right? He would have seen her. He says the incident happened on February 10th, five days before the body was found. Let's look at the validity to this claim. He was in the field. He had a, a wolf from when he lived in Anchorage, Alaska, that he had adopted there. And when he brought it to Texas, he didn't carry the right certification in order to house an exotic animal. So it needed to be boarded with a person who was experienced in taking care of these animals. And every once in a while, Danny would go and get his wolf and take it out for what is called exercise. So... He had this animal, an animal that is very driven to, to eat weaker animals, and that's how they thrive in the wild. And then he has a lion cub who is exactly the same. There's not years of evolution where these animals have become pets and, and you know, are dominated by human beings and in instruction. They're wild. They, they're not, you can't house train them. They still have that instinct. So had they been in that field just five days before Tony's body was found, you would like to think that the wolf and lion cub would have located the body within a hundred yards of that trolley and began to feast away on her. And I know this is gross and it's a little gory, but you have to look at this in order to validate whether or not Danny could be telling the truth about being in this field. She'd been there for 27 days. We know that in hindsight, investigators weren't really sure. There was evidence that she had been chewed on by animals, and that just creeps me out. Ugh. But there wasn't anything vicious like you would expect to have happened with a lion cub and a wolf who had found a weakened human able to feast on it. The two, you would think, would have fought and, and tore the body apart right? Danny would not have been able to control that situation. But nowhere in there does he, he talk about seeing a body a hundred yards. Had he climbed on top of that trolley, he could see the field for a far more than a hundred yards. When the utility worker found Tony Gibbs, he didn't even have to get within a hundred yards to realize it's not a mannequin I'm looking at. That is a dead person. Turned around, hightailed it out of there. So can we, can we, can we confirm that Danny's story has some kind of validity? No, not at all. But in hindsight, we're looking at it. So that's how come we can automatically ixnay. Dude, you weren't in that field. And if you were in that field, 
you are probably doing something you shouldn't be doing, right? Nonetheless, Danny Laughlin's talking about how he had talked to Tony prior to her disappearance. He kind of got a little dark with some of his remarks while she was gone, while she was missing. And now this dumbass is putting himself at the scene of the crime just days before the body is found. Here's something else a little bit more incriminating to this whole story. The thing about this field out on 281 with this abandoned trolley car, a lot of employees of the Stardust Club knows about that field. So let's just go ahead and check that off for self-incrimination again, right? Danny was encouraged by friends and family to shut the hell up about being in that field and to stop talking about how he had talked to Tony. He, he just needed to drop the case, move on. In hindsight, he does what we are all doing. We all look at evidence in the case. We all discuss it. That is what I'm sitting here doing with you right now. However, I'm not dumb enough to put myself in a place of where a murder occurred where a body was found, and I sure as hell don't go around talking about an open investigation like I know a thing or two that the police don't know, right? We're not that dumb. Here's the other thing. Danny claimed to have some inside information, and they told him that Tony had been raped, she had been stabbed, and then she was shot twice with a 22. Hindsight, no, it's not true. However, during that time, how do you know? unless she were there the day the body was recovered, right? Well, Danny got a little worried with this information because just a week or so before Tony's disappearance, he made a claim with the police department that his truck had been broken into and he had a couple 22 guns stolen from inside of his truck. So we're hearing what had been done to her, where she was found. He's putting himself at the location and now he's saying, I have a couple 22 guns missing. Well, hell, if not all the alarm bells and whistles are going off and we think this is the guy of the year, right? Case open, closed, we've got it. Those closest to Danny are like, um, I don't really think I know you as well as I thought I had. And I need to get the hell away from you before you bring me down in whatever shit you're in, right? That's how I would be. Well, come mid-February, Danny walks up to the door of his apartment, and guess what is there taped to his door? A business card from the Wichita Falls City Police Department with the note of, call us at your earliest convenience. Danny, he's like, well, I don't have nothing to hide. Picks up the phone, calls them that very afternoon. And he tells them, like a dumbass, I've been expecting to hear from you, and the cops are like, really why why are you expecting to hear from us and he says well that girl getting killed with a 22 and i had made a claim with y'all that i had a couple stolen before she disappeared now i'm a little concerned that maybe it was one of my guns that were used in this murder and the police are like hmm you have some information we want to hear so let's not spook him because if we spook him he may not talk to us anymore and we can't have that, so let's just put him at ease. And they tell him, you know, well, there's nothing to worry about. We're not coming at you with shackles or chains. You're fine. And Danny's like, oh, cool. Okay. So Danny sets up a, a, an appointment to come back and talk with officers later on February 26th. When Danny gets home that afternoon, he realizes he's made a mistake. There's something he has to do on February 26th that could possibly lead to a potential job. So it's very important he doesn't rearrange that meeting. So he calls back to Wichita Falls. He lets them know what's going on. And he's like, I need to move my meeting. Can I come in a day earlier? Police are like, sure, no problem. Come on in. When they hang up the phone, they did not see this as an oversight in Danny's organization skills. They didn't see that. They saw this as he has something to say and he's eager to tell us what it is. And we're eager to let him. That's what they read that whole situation as. What? That's not true. Danny shows up the day before the 26th and they are questioning him like, how did you know certain things that were pertain pertaining to the case? Why are you obsessed with this case? Um, had 
since you saying you were in that field five days before the body was found, did you see the body? All the talk he had been spouting about the last 27, 30 days since the disappearance of Tony Gibbs and finding of the body, it's all starting to come back and bite him in the ass, right? Police know now that they've heard that he's constantly talking about this case. He's constantly talking about Tony. There's an obsession there with this girl. He knows certain evidence about the case that wasn't really released. So where'd you learn that information? He puts himself at the crime scene and now he's claiming to be missing something that could be a murder weapon, even though we know there was no gunshot wounds to this girl. But let's hear what he's got to say, right? So they're, they want to know. It's all coming back to bite him in the butt. And police, they are positive. We've got our suspects. We've got... All we got to do is set a case up against him. And if we let him continue talking, he could possibly do that for us. Well, they asked Danny if he can hand over a hair and blood sample. And he, he agrees to. And they ask him, you know, you want to come back and take a polygraph test? And Danny says, you know, I'll take those, but just to let you know, I've had to take them in order to have a job before in the past, and I didn't, I couldn't pass them. It's not that I'm deceptive, it's I'm naturally a nervous person. And I can understand that I can get behind that with Danny because if you was to hook me up right now and ask me some of the most straight laced questions that I know with, you know, without a shadow of doubt, I'm gonna show deception because that's just who I am. I have a problem with feeling like I'm in trouble and it automatically sets off the sweats and, and rapid heart rate. And I'm sure my blood pressure is terrifying. You know, that's just who I am. And there's a lot of people out there that are like that, which makes inaccuracy of the polygraph test that they still haven't figured out how to make it more accurate. Therefore, that's why it's not permitted as use inside of the courtroom Nine times out of ten, when, when the police department's pulling out a polygraph test, they're doing because it will eventually invoke a confession from the person because they're going to, all you have to be like is, we know you're lying. And they're going to think, shit, I've been caught. Might as well just tell them the truth. It's never admissible in court, okay? So Danny lets them know up front, I can do this, but it's, I'm not going to pass them. And they're thinking, you're not going to pass them because you're going to lie. Doesn't matter. Danny sits down. He takes three polygraph tests and he shows deception on all three. Later, it was determined that the place that he was boarding the wolf he brought back with him from Alaska confirmed he did own the wolf and they could come in and take some hair sample for testing because there was some animal hair found around a couple of the wounds on Tony Gibbs's body. But the owner of the, the boarding place was very adamant that Danny doesn't own a lion cub. I own a lion cub because I can because it's registered but he doesn't own one and he's never taken his wolf and my cub out anywhere. He's never taken my cub anywhere period. So they've already found a hole in Danny's you know prevalence to the story. He says he was out in that field with a, a wolf and a cub. But now they know, well, maybe he didn't have the cub. He just had his wolf. Maybe he's just misremembering. On March 8th of 1985, a grand jury was convened in Archer City. It's a small little town about 40 minutes south of Wichita Falls. And if you've ever read or watched Lonesome Dove or heard of The Last Picture Show by Larry McMurtry, you would have heard of Archer City. In this tiny little town that, seriously, it looks like, if you drive through it, you're going to miss it if you blink. It, it, they are slowly coming into the 21st century. But it's still a small town. There's still history there. And you can feel it when you go into this tiny town. This is where Danny is being charged or at least that's what they're hoping with the grand jury, they will hand down an indictment to charge Danny with the murder of Tony Gibbs. There's nothing there for him. All of this talk he had done about Tony, all, you know, since the moment she was reported missing, all of it is starting to play back in his head and he's thinking, you know, I really screwed up here. 
In the end, an indictment was not handed down. Not yet. Right now, the only crime Danny was guilty of was giving false information. But wait. On April of 1985, there was a lady named Nikki Standiford, and she was out with her friends and husband. They were talking about Tony's case, okay, and about how this poor woman was found in this field out on 281. And Nikki says, you know, I was out there around that time, and I remember seeing a tall man with dark hair and a really big dog on some kind of chain or rope. And her friends are like, you saw what? And so she kind of is telling him about what she remembers seeing. And, her, you know, her friends and her husband are like, um, we, you need to go talk to the police. Why, why haven't you said anything? But Nikki was notorious for not keeping up what was going on in the news. It hadn't crossed her mind that she may have seen something very important to the case. So she goes and she talks to Archer city police department she tells them what she saw out on 281 and they were like hey you want to take a ride with us we're going to let you look at something i want you to see if you remember it so they take her out to the boarding place where danny's wolf was and the owner pulls the wolf out and lets nikki look and she goes that's the animal i saw in the field that day that that is that's the dog now they have somebody who is a witness to putting Danny in the field February 10th, 1985 with his wolf. And this time, Danny's indicted on perjury charges and he was held in Archer City's jail. Okay, so the perjury charge is because he said he wasn't really in the field, but now we've got somebody saying he was in the field. Still not enough evidence to hand down a murder charge. But they're getting somewhere. At least they have a charge that they can hold him on. And if there's no bell set, well, he's going to sit in jail until his trial, which just gives us even more time to build a case against him. Things are starting to stack up and a railroad is um, slowly being built for Danny Laughlin. In June of 1985, Barry Maka, Wichita County's district attorney, was sitting around working on his own cold case of Terry Sins when he received a phone call from a local bail bondsman. And they had a man in their office named Harry Harrison, and he had something that Maka may want to hear. So Barry tells him, you know, come on over to the office and we'll sit down and talk. Once Harry gets there, he tells Maka, I shared a cell with Danny, and during the short time we were roommates, he told me how he killed Tony Gibbs. According to Harry, the reason that Danny killed Tony was because she could identify him as the one to rape her, and that he went back the next day to the field that she was dumped in, and his dog ate part of her dead body. Now, we do know there was evidence of mutilation from animals from her time in the field, so this is starting to line up with the autopsy report. So Maka asked him, you know, how, how about you come back tomorrow? We'll write this out and you can sign a sworn statement. And at first, Harry, he's, he's hesitant. He's a career criminal. He's in the DA's office. He's turning over information about another criminal. And if word gets out, well, he's a snitch. And if something happens later down the line, he gets in more trouble, goes back to jail. This whole incident could come back to bite him in the ass. So he's very hesitant. And Maka tells him, you know, this girl, she, she deserves justice. You know, we need to do this poor girl right. And so Harry decides, you know, I will come back tomorrow and I will sign this sworn statement and I will take a polygraph test. Surprise, surprise, Harry changed his mind. He never showed up for his appointment with Maka the next day. Maka, he tracks him down. He talks to him. He's like, hey, Harry, why didn't you come in? And why don't you do what we had talked about? And, and Harry tells him, you know, what if, what if people find out I'm a rat? You know, that's not going to look good on me. And Maka, he convinces after some very soft coaxing words, he convinces Harry to come in the following day and they will do what they were supposed to do that day at their meeting. Well, Harry disappears. Being a career criminal turned snitch just wasn't something Harry was convinced to being committed to being a, of. You know, I, he, 
That's not good for you. That whole saying, snitches get stitches, it's a saying for a reason. So now that they've lost this, this witness with, within Harry Harrison, which is, to me, looking back, he's not the most credible witness, first of all. He's a career criminal. Lord only knows what he's saying in order to get the DA to offer him something to, to get him out of trouble. So is he opening his mouth and telling Maka this story of how Danny killed this poor girl because he had raped her and he didn't want her to ID him as being her rapist? Or is there some truth to it? And how, how do we trust a criminal other than him signing a sworn statement and taking a polygraph? Well, he doesn't get it. So now police need to sink all of their efforts into building a case against Danny Laughlin. When building a case, think of it as a house of cards. You have to have a foundation, a good foundation. And Barry Maka thought Harry and his, and his testimony could be that solid foundation for this case and they could build up around it. Because as it stood without Nikki, Nikki and her testimony and without Harry and his testimony, there's not a lot of evidence there. Everything is circumstantial. And it's really hard to, to eliminate doubt when everything is just circumstantial. So they, they're sinking all their efforts in because they are convinced they have their man despite losing Harry Harrison as a, as a witness. So Danny, while his time in jail over in Archer City, he's pressured by guards and they're trying to get him to write out a confession. Detectives are visiting with him to try and get him to write out a confession. And Danny is not going to sign something to say he did something that he did not do. He's an innocent man. Well, once this whole railroad train comes rolling through the middle of Danny Laughlin in his life, he realizes I may be innocent, but I may not get off on this. I'm starting to lose hope in the fact that a jury of my peers will believe their story versus mine. And the, the words of the guards are beginning to weigh down on him because now, you know, he's not giving over confession. So now they're saying, well, because you won't, you won't confess to killing this girl, they're going to convict you of murder and then they're going to put a needle in your arm and execute you. And this becomes terrifying. And it would to anybody in his position, guilty or not. The idea that the state of Texas or the state or any state could put a needle in your arm and kill you and you know you're an innocent person, that's terrifying. To put a needle in your arm and know you are a guilty person, terrifying. It doesn't change with the circumstances. No, you know, most of us walk our day to day unaware of when our last day here would be. But if you're sitting on death row, eventually a date is given to you and, and it will be your death date. You don't get to live in ignorance. You know, and you can literally count down the last days of your life. So Danny decides he's going to write his mom. He needs to talk to her and he lets her know, you know, what's going on with the guards and what they're telling him, and there's a there's a strong possibility that he could be convicted for killing that girl, and they could execute him. And if they decided to execute him, he really, he wanted his mother and sister to be there, because they're the only people that would believe what he's been saying this whole time. And this, this weighs on his mother. I mean, it's weighing on Danny and his spirit. Because when he first walked into the middle of this investigation, he did so with his head held high because he was innocent. And the only reason he knew information is because he had some insiders and they were leaking information to him. And it made him cool to be around because he could talk about this case and he could tell them things the news wasn't telling them. Danny, I, at this point, he's guilty of being an intention whore, but that's it. That's it. I mean, there's not a case here. But the guards and the detectives, they're telling them, we've got a case against you and it doesn't look good for you. In reality, they're bluffing. Detectives and investigators and everybody in law enforcement 
uses a bluff a time or two to try and pull one over and, and get a genuine confession. It doesn't always work. And when it does work, you know, you, you're going to step back and wonder, did we coerce an innocent man into a confession or did we finally talk some sense into a guilty man and he confessed? There's always that question in the back of their mind. On April 8th of 1986, Danny Laughlin walked into the Gainesville courthouse and he stood trial for the murder of Tony Gibbs. Wichita County DA Barry Maka and Archer County DA Jack McGahee joined forces to prosecute Danny Laughlin. And their first witness on the stand was Nikki Standiford. And she told them about witnessing Danny in the field with a very large dog the same field that Terry's body was found in on February 10th, just five days prior to her body being found. This is devastating to the defense. You know, it puts Danny at the crime scene. Then Maka calls to stand Harry Harrison. Our little career criminal has come out of the shadows and decided he's going to testify. Now, you can call him a snitch, a Tyler, a whistleblower, whatever you want to. Reality, Harry has gone and turned to being an informant. And he was going to tell the jury what he told Maka not even a year before. Now, when the defense got up and cross-examinated Harry, they asked him one of the questions was, were you offered any kind of reward in exchange for your testimony today? And Harry says no. Well, guess what? Defense knows that not true. Prosecution has offered to expunge 17 charges from his record. 17. And he still has a record beyond that. That is a lot of, of criminal charges. And to me, finding out that they're taking 17 away and he still has more, if I was on that jury, I would be very skeptical of everything I just heard him say. For one, you lied about the fact that you weren't offered anything. That's not a good thing. If you can lie about that, did you lie about the story? For two, you're a career criminal. Are you just saying it because you want to be in the spotlight? You know, are you pulling your own Danny Laughlin kind of situation here? Questions and doubt are raised once they are learned about his expungement of some charges. Next on this stand is Phil Rocket Gieri. I probably just butchered that last name and I apologize. But he is another one that stood on the on the jury or on the stand and he tells the jury, you know, that Danny said there was no point for them to keep on looking for that missing nurse. They were never going to find her. So now we have Danny making these dark threats almost. Is it a threat though? I mean, no, not really. But Anyways, he's making these dark statements about Tony and, and her disappearance. The last to take the stand and the third to what is known as the jailhouse trio is Roger Williams. Roger gets up and testifies that Danny told him that even though he was guilty, he had this case beat and he was going to be free within two weeks. And that when he got free, he would write Roger and let him know. This... <laughs> Again, did you hear it? Did you hear it wrong? I can see Danny saying, you know, I have this case beat. I'm innocent and I'll be out in a couple of weeks. No big deal. He has hope that, you know, a jury will see his side and see the truth and he'll be free. But that's not what was turned around and said on the stand. Again, this is that telephone game coming back to bite people in the ass with what they originally said versus what is heard in the end. Now, while all these men took the stand and told stories of what Danny did and didn't say during his time in jail waiting for his trial, it wasn't hard to determine what the defendant was thinking. He was very angry. He, he made quite a few gestures, quite a few scoffs. His face contorted in anger as each man spoke more about something they had no idea and lied about saying Danny did this and Danny didn't do that. And he made it known because his defense counsel had to lean into him and reprimand him and to, you know, calm down. 
we're going you're going to end up in contempt of court and you won't even be on here and you won't be able to to see this trial unfold and you are the one that's on trial so cool your heels and set back danny is not like most of your defense most of them will set at that table they will look forward or their eyes will be cast down there's no emotion there's no remorse there's no talking there's nothing they they listen to the people talk about their lives hanging in the balance Okay, Danny was not going to go down without letting people know he was mad at these people because they were taking the stand and they were freaking lying. So, you know, he got in trouble a couple of times. Joyce Gregory, she takes the stand for the defense and she confirms that she and Danny were together January 19th, 1985 from about 1130 a.m. until later in the afternoon. On the day that Tony went missing, right? Okay. What were they doing? Well, Joyce was helping Danny move into his new apartment on Fillmore Street. And she said that Danny took her home about 5.30 that evening. And then the two saw each other again that night when Danny showed up for his shift at the Stardust Club. Another co-worker from the Stardust also took the stand and confirmed that Danny did have some downtime during his shift. So he was able to talk to some of the the club goers so it wasn't impossible for him to talk to Tony and they not know it the other thing that this co-worker confirmed was Gregory and Laughlin spending the time together January 19th and helping him move into his new apartment and then Danny did show up for his shift later that evening so there's confirmation that there was a very narrow window for Danny to have kidnapped Tony and killed her he was only without people for a short time in the morning and for a short time in the afternoon. Next person to take the stand for the defense was a gentleman named Bill Blanton. He was a supervisor where Nikki Standiford worked. And he said on the day that she claims to have saw Danny in the field with the large dog, either February 9th or February 10th, neither one of those were possible as she was clocked in and on shift for both days. So now the defense has punched a hole in one of the prosecution's key witnesses. They didn't check her time card at her job. So this is, we're casting doubt left and right, okay? The next thing that happens will shock you because it shocks all of us. Danny takes the stand in his defense. This is something we as true crime nerds know is not a common thing. It's very rare. When it happens, nine times out of ten, the, the person taking the stand, they are counseled to shut the hell up and sit down. But they're adamant, you know, I'm going to talk in my defense. It's my right. And it is their right. But nine times out of ten, people listen to the people that they are paying a lot of money to and decide to sit down, shut up, and don't even worry about it, right? not Danny, and not his counsel. They get him up on the stand, and they ask him what he was doing on January 19th, 1985. And Danny told him, you know, I had done a little bit of laundry that morning before moving, and then he and Joyce were moving him into his new apartment, and he knows Joyce was there because she hung the pictures in his apartment. The two later went over to the flea market, then to Burger King, and then Danny took Joyce home around 5.30 so he could go back home and get ready for work. Now, here's the kicker. He has to tell the jury what he was doing the day of February 10th. And in order to convince them that he was not guilty of murder, he had to self-incriminate. Because on February 10th, 1985, Danny was breaking into the Southwestern Bell telephone office in Wichita Falls and stealing their cash box. He took it out to another deserted field, broke into the cash box. He was chased away by somebody who had saw him. It was a hellacious day for Danny. He wasn't in the field on 281. He was somewhere else trying to get out of his own trouble that he had just gotten himself into. And then they asked Danny, how do you know facts about the case? before they were either talked about in the media or not ever released in the media. 
And Danny tells them, I went into the captain's office under suspicion of another crime. He left me in there for about 30 minutes unsupervised. And right there on the table, right there on his desk, was Tony Gibbs' case file. I read it. I wasn't supposed to, but nobody was there to stop me. And I had all this time, so it I had to pass the time somehow. Now, all of my true crime nerds out there, tell me, if you were sitting in, in an unintended room and you had your opportunity to peek at some case files of active investigations, murder investigation, what have you, would you not contemplate doing exactly what Danny did? And if you say no, you wouldn't contemplate it. You're lying because you're listening to the show right now. <laughs> but it, the curiosity is there. And, you know, remember to the great saying, curiosity kills the cat, but satisfaction brings it back. Curiosity did kill Danny Laughlin until he found all the, the ins and outs of the case that the media hadn't talked about. So he had to tell them, you know, I looked at some paperwork I wasn't supposed to. I stole money from Southwestern Bell on the day I was supposedly in the field. And the only reason I know what I know about the case is because I looked at paperwork and I wasn't supposed to. That's Danny's story. How, that's how he explains all of this. His inside information came from his very own eyeballs, but he couldn't say I was looking at the case file at the police station because nobody's going to believe that. So he just had to say I had an informant. But he had details wrong about the case. We know that because he talks about her being shot with a 22 when she was never shot. The jury goes in and, and they deliberate for over 14 hours split into two days. Prosecution and defense can hear the jury talking. They can hear them arguing. They can hear them yelling. They can hear crying. And prosecution is not sure if it's a good or bad thing for them. The defense is not sure if it's a good or bad thing for them. Everybody is just overwhelmed and so ready to be over this case. The jury comes out. Everybody takes their seat. The foreman gets up and they learn they cannot convict Danny Laughlin of the murder of Tony Gibbs, but they cannot find him innocent in the murder of Tony Gibbs. They are hung jury. And for Danny, this is a win. Okay. It's not... Let's clarify things. Let's lay everything out on the table. It's not that he can never be brought up against these charges again, because he can, because there was no conviction and there was no acquittal. Okay. It was a hung jury. So all, all that means is they need to do a new jury selection, do a new trial, and hope the next jury can come to one or the other conclusions. The other thing is Danny earned the right to leave the courtroom without bracelets on his arms. He was free to set up for the next trial, okay? Maka and McGehe were confident that them and their team of investigators were going to come back in and they were going to bring Danny Laughlin down for the murder of Tony Gibbs because in their eyes, he was guilty. There was no convincing them of anything different yet. Two women in the medical industry in Wichita Falls, Texas, one case cold with no leads and the other whose prime suspect had been tried and unconvicted due to a hung jury. Maka and his team of investigators were never able to bring Danny Laughlin back to trial for the murder of Tony Gibbs. He perished in a car accident in 1993, leaving Tony's case cold along with Terry Sims. Farian left Wichita Falls to not only put distance between himself and the two murders that he wanted to forget, but he still struggled with his addiction to drugs and alcohol and the lack of responsibility for his own life and the path that he was going down. Joanna had taken the kids and left him, and his only one true love was whatever drug that was keeping him from facing the fact that his life was in a downward spiral and he was a serial killer in the making, whether he was ready to admit it or not. No matter the amount of screaming at the sky or cursing of God, he did nothing to do and change his life for the better. 
I want to thank you all for joining me tonight in this case where you have to go back to the beginning to understand it all. Fairy and Wardrop is a black mark on the city of Wichita Falls, but he doesn't define the city nor its population. Join me next week as we close out that case that requires us to go back to the beginning to understand the story as a whole. As always, I leave you with one last line. Sometimes going back to the beginning is the only way. Much love, the true crime librarian.